Lord, now as we come to your word, we pray that you would teach us. Lord, we pray that you would challenge us, that you would open up to us your truth. God, I pray that as we look at um, a church in Corinth with all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems, that we would see ourselves, that we would be confronted by the areas of our own spiritual immaturity, and Lord, that you would call us, even in the next few weeks, to continue to grow up into Christ, our Savior. Lord, make us more holy. Help us to look more and more like Jesus so that we can bear witness about him to the world around us, we pray. And we ask that in his name. Amen. Okay, three people. Three people. Lord Byron, <coughs> Jimi Hendrix, and Josh Shaw. Lord Byron, Jimi Hendrix, Josh Shaw. The third one a bit lesser known than the first two, although some of you know who Josh Shaw is. Three people whose recent life, well not recent, one of them, but their life decisions all make the same point. Okay, here's what I mean. Lord Byron, how many of you have heard of Lord Byron? All right, I was an English lit major, so I enjoyed reading his, his uh, writings. He wrote Don Juan, if you've ever heard of Don Juan, a great English author. Uh, obviously a very gifted writer. And yet a few interesting things about Lord Byron that I read about in the past week. First of all, during his time in university in England, he became very upset that he was not allowed to keep a pet dog in his dorm at his university. And so he tried to find a way to respond to this, and he scoured the rule books for the university and found that there was no mention that you were not able to keep a bear. <laughs> so he went out and got a pet bear and kept it on campus in his dorm room, and from time to time he paraded around campus on a leash. Later in his life, as he became an adult, his kind of strange penchant for this wanting to be around uh, animals that you really shouldn't have as pets took even more extreme forms. At one point, he was living in a house with eight to 10 different species of animals just wandering free in his house. The other thing I found out about Lord Byron, which I did not know before, was that he also was fascinated with naval battles, sea battles. And he would set up toy ships in the pond outside of his house. And he would sit up on the hill and command imaginary naval battles, and he would make his servant uh, wade through the pond and move the ships according to his direction as the sea captain. Okay, so, so there's Lord Byron. There's the picture of Lord Byron. Jimi Hendrix, not quite so humorous an example, but widely regarded as, at least in the history of rock and roll, the greatest guitarist of all time. Uh, he died at the age of 27 in 1970. He is almost as equally well known for his abuse of drugs and alcohol as he is for his uh, amazing talent on the guitar. And also, for those who were close to him, his propensity to violence, violent activity, angry behavior when intoxicated. The last example is Josh Shaw. Josh Shaw is a USC cornerback. He's a football player for the University of South, uh, Southern California. And about a month ago, he turned up with two sprained ankles. And according to his story, he told his coaches and then began to tell reporters as this began to make national headlines that he had injured both of his ankles leaping out of a window in a successful attempt to save the life of his seven-year-old nephew who was drowning in a swimming pool. Unfortunately for Josh Shaw, it began to come to light in the days after that that yes, he had sprained both of his ankles jumping off a balcony, but it was not in an attempt to save a seven-year-old nephew who had never actually been in any danger at all. But there was speculation that actually he was trying to evade police in a pursuit. So that was the correction of the story for Josh Shaw. Well, what's my point with all of these three people? Lord Byron, Jimi Hendrix, Josh Shaw. Here's the point. It is possible to be extremely gifted and yet extremely immature. So talk about three extremely gifted people, a, an amazing writer and author and poet, perhaps the greatest guitarist of all time, a Division I football player, a great athlete, extremely immature and even sinful, in some cases, decisions. 
That's certainly the case in Corinth. Ancient Corinth, first century Corinth, is a church full of people who are incredibly gifted, as we're going to see in a minute. Amazing gifts, and yet incredibly spiritually immature. So that's why we've called this series Grow Up. It's going to be a call to all of us, a call to myself included. Many of you are gifted. Many of you, uh, God has committed amazing gifts and talents and abilities to. And yet the call to you this year and for the rest of your life is to grow up to mature in Jesus Christ. You can be gifted and also very spiritually immature. Here's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 to 17. 1 Corinthians 1, 1 to 17. And what we're going to do is two things. First of all, we're going to get introduced to the Corinthians. So we're going to travel, quote unquote, to ancient Corinth, figure out what kind of a city this was, what kind of a church this was in ancient Corinth. Then we're going to see the first sign of immaturity. So the first thing that the Apostle Paul points out that is an indication that they are sinfully immature, not growing up into Christ in the way that they should. So first of all, number one, let's go to Corinth. A little bit of background on the city of Corinth before we get into the actual text. Uh, What you need to know about Corinth is that it was a first century Roman colony. So by the time Paul would have gotten there, it would have been well established as a colony of Rome. What that meant was that it was a very polytheistic place. So if you had walked through the streets of ancient Corinth in the first century, you would have seen idols and shrines to all kinds of different gods and goddesses all throughout Corinth. Extremely polytheistic place. The other thing you need to know about Corinth is that it was a port city. So it was located on one of the major trade routes of the ancient Near East. That means that Corinth, as well as other port cities, would have been known for uh, sinful, illicit forms of entertainment, all kinds of depraved behavior, debauchery. In fact, one scholar points out that by Paul's time, the word Corinthian had actually come to be used as an adjective which meant depraved. So in Paul's day, if you would have called someone or, or the behavior of someone very Corinthian, you would have been saying, ooh, that's illicit and sexual and disgusting. So that, that was so identified with Corinth that there was actually an adjective based on the town name. So that's the kind of city that we're talking about, ancient Corinth in the first century. But I want to focus on the fact that then in that context, in a polytheistic, polytheistic, pagan context, this amazing church of Jesus Christ has been planted and has sprung up in this city. Now, sometimes when you're reading an epistle, it's good to turn back to the Acts, the account in the book of Acts that records the first planting of the church in that city. So we're going to do that now. Uh, Turn back to Acts 18. This is the only place I'll have you turn today. Acts chapter 18, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 11. It's important because this is the foundation for how this church got here in Corinth. So Acts 18, 1 to 11, I'll read it out. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come back from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. You heard Pastor Josh talk about that in his sermon this morning. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent from now on. I'm going to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Don't be afraid, but go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And listen to verse 11. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So you can see Paul does his usual thing. He goes to the synagogue first in Corinth. He reasons with the Jews. They eventually go after him, start to revile him, uh, insult him. So he turns to the Gentiles, and there's this huge amount of faith in the city of Corinth. 
And you can see that Paul not only plants this church in Corinth, but verse 11, he stays for a year and a half pastoring the church. So this is a church that's planted by Paul and then watered and taught and grown up under Paul's leadership. So an amazing personal investment that Paul has in this church in Corinth. So that's the little bit of the background of the city. You can see it's amazing. This is God's miraculous work that here's this church, this vibrant church full of believers uh, with the encouragement of God um, and the, the planting and watering of Paul right in the middle of this kind of a city. Okay, look at verses 1 to 9. We're going to look at Paul's introduction to the book. And I want you to notice, I've mentioned already, this is a church with serious issues. We're going to get into that even today and then really for the continuing weeks. We're going to look at the issues that Corinth has. But I want you to see a few things about Paul's introduction to this letter first. So first of all, verses 1 to 3, I want you to notice how Paul goes out of his way to describe the people in Corinth as saints. Christians, holy people of God. So look at verses 1 to 3. Paul, it says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the first thing you see, verses 1 to 3. Paul's going out of his way to say, I'm writing to Christians. I'm writing to those sanctified, holy people, set apart people for God. Then he calls them saints. And then in verse 2, end of verse 2, he links them with all of the people who are worshiping Jesus around the world. So he's going out of his way to say, hey, before I get into you, before I lay into you for all these issues you have, I want to be clear I'm writing to God's people. That's verses 1 to 3. Now, we'll talk more about what that should mean for us in a minute. Verses 4 to 9, then, not only are, there saint, are they saints, Paul's focus is on how gifted they are. So look at what he says, first of all, verses 4 to 5. He says, I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and all knowledge. So what were the Corinthians gifted in? First of all, speech and knowledge. So they had many people who could speak well about the gospel and about Jesus Christ. Not much of a surprise because Paul's been there for 18 months training them and teaching them. And then they're enriched in all knowledge, he says. So they know the Bible. They know the gospel. They get the things of Christ. So speech and knowledge. He's actually going to come back to those things. And he's going to rebuke them because they've made those things bigger than other more important things. But that's for a later uh, message. Then look at what he says in verses 6 to 7. He says, Even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you've got to catch that. Paul says, you guys are not lacking any gift. You are, to put it in today's terms, the church who has everything. You've got the best preachers, best Sunday school classes, best small groups, best worship team, best outreach. You are the church that has everything. You are not lacking in any gift. Amazingly gifted church. Now, I'll mention again, this is a church that has problems. Keep that in mind. In fact, the rest of the letter is going to be Paul addressing the problems that this church has. But then look at the way he ends his introduction, verses 8 to 9. He is going to get to their problems, but first he starts with an amazing promise in verses 8 to 9. Let me read verses 8 to 9. The Lord Jesus Christ, verse 8, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. So a church that has problems, and yet Paul starts by doing this. Number one, you guys are saints. You're sanctified. You're God's people. Number two, I'm so proud of you. You're so gifted. And number three, there's this promise of God that God is actually going to hold you guiltless until the end. He's going to sustain you and complete the good work that he's begun in you. It's so important that we see that that's how Paul starts this letter. And here's why. Here's the illustration I think about. Have you ever walked into or, or, or been about to walk into a dinner party or a meeting and you've been stopped with like a moment of horror that you might be underdressed? Has that ever happened to you? So you're about to walk in somewhere, and maybe you're wearing jeans and a sweater, and you think, should I be wearing a tie? 
and you walk into the door, and you look over, and there's someone with a t-shirt. And you're like, oh, good, I'm fine. <laughs> you realize it's more casual than you thought, and you're OK. That's a little bit um, of the sense that we should have when we come to the book of 1 Corinthians. Like, these people are way more messed up than we are. <laughs> In other words, there's room at the table for Christians who don't have it yet all together. There should be that sense when we come to the book of 1 Corinthians. And the fact that Paul introduces a letter to the Corinthians by saying, you're saints, you're gifted, and guess what? God's actually going to keep you guiltless until the end. That should be encouraging to us who don't yet have it all together. So for those of you who are still struggling with sin, for those of you who think you are still messed up, probably because you are still messed up, this should be a very encouraging beginning to a letter like this. Now with that being said, that does not mean that Paul will not lay into these Christians and call them to change. So to put it a different way, God invites you to come to Christ, to come to him, to join his family just the way you are. And yet the challenge from Paul, from Scripture, from God himself will be, I want you to change and be formed more into my image. I want you to grow up. And that's what we see Paul starting to do in verses 10 to 17. So we've met the Corinthians, we've seen Paul's introduction, now we come to the first sign of immaturity. Okay, so the first way that this church is not growing up, is sinfully immature, 10 to 17, it's divisions. Divisions in the church. Let me read verses 10 to 12, just the beginning of the description of what's going on in the church in Corinth. So Paul says, I appeal to you brothers. So now he's getting into the body of the letter, he's starting to go after their issues. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. So here's what's going on. In the church, in the church at Corinth, there is this divisiveness, there's hatefulness, there's anger, there's a lack of unity that's based on people identifying themselves with certain human leaders and their camps. So Paul says, here's the report that I've gotten from Chloe's people. And by the way, it's funny to think about this letter being uh, read out publicly in Corinth and everybody turns and looks at Chloe, who's given this report to Paul. <laughs> but anyway, you've got these different groups. You've got some people saying, hey, we're Paul people. We're really aligned with Paul. And then you've got others who are aligning themselves with Apollos, others with Cephas, who's Peter. And then I love this. You've got this fourth group who looks at all the other groups and goes, we're with Jesus. <laughs> I follow Christ. And they're dividing on the basis of that as well. So it's just another source of division, actually, that this fourth group is creating. Well, here's what I want to say before we go to Paul's response to it. Um, I just want us to know and be honest about the fact that we absolutely do this same thing today. In fact, this is the first of many points in the book of 1 Corinthians when we're going to look at Corinth and we're going to go, they are us. <laughs> they are exactly like us. Now, I don't know what this looks like on the Wheaton campus today. I know what it looked like 10 years ago, and it would look like something like this, okay? Nobody get offended, but I do hunger. I'm, I'm a hunger person, or I'm an RA. Or if someone asks you, what's he like? You know, what's that guy like? Is he walking with the Lord? Is he a good Christian? Well, he's on the football team, <laughs> right? Or even just generally in a group like this or a church like this, um, for some of you students who don't go to Wheaton, those Wheaton kids, <laughs> those Christian college kids, right? We have our ways of separating people who all unite around the same gospel into different camps. And guess what? Pastors do it too. I mean, so, so we will be guilty. We'll be interviewing a pastoral resident here for a new spot on our staff, and we'll say, Oh, he's a Piper guy. He's coming from Bethlehem Baptist. He's a Piper guy. He's okay. As if that's more important than being a Jesus guy. So we do this, too. We make these kinds of divisions. Obviously, in Corinth, they've gone to a pretty serious level where people probably aren't even really interacting with each other. They're not even eating together because they're Paul people or Apollos people. Well, look at Paul's response to this, 13 to 16. 
He says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized into the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one may say that you were baptized in my name. Uh, I'll, I'll say verse 16 for, for a second, because I love verse 16. I'll tell you why. So there's this dividing of Christ. Paul says, is Christ divided? Can Jesus actually be ripped apart? Because that's what you're doing. <coughs> now I want to clarify what's going on here. I want to make a little bit of a caveat. And here's what it is. All divisions are not necessarily evil. To make a division for the right reason can actually be a good thing. It can actually be in obedience to God's word. Uh, one of my mentors and professors at Trinity, Don Carson, I know I quoted him last week. I could quote him every week because he's brilliant. But he talks about the fact that unity is a virtue. <clears throat> unity is a virtue, but it is not an ultimate virtue. Truth is an ultimate virtue. The truth of the gospel, the truth of who God is, what the Bible teaches, what Jesus did for sinners on the cross, that's ultimate. We must uphold that truth at all costs even at the cost of unity. So there is a time when we break unity for the sake of truth. Does that make sense? So imagine if, if I, as the pastor, college pastor here, um, had a contingent, a heretical contingent of 50 or so of you from this group, and we began to teach that Jesus was not the only way to eternal salvation with God. It would be the right thing for the rest of you to make a division from us, to break from us, to break unity over something like that. So divisions are not always bad. Here's why they're bad in the context of Corinth. Two reasons. Number one, they are dividing people who hold to the same true gospel. That's why Paul says, verse 13, can Christ be divided? These are people who should not be dividing. They hold to the same true gospel. So that's the first reason. Secondly, they are on the basis of human leaders. It's not on the basis of doctrine, not on the basis of truth. It's on the basis of what human you've kind of linked on to, your camp. That's why it's such an issue. Now back to verse 16. I love verse 16. And I want you to imagine, as I read verse 16, that you were someone other than Crispus and Gaius who had been baptized by Paul and were using that baptism by Paul as a reason for why you were in Paul's camp. Okay, look at verse 16. I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't know whether I baptized anybody else. <laughs> And you're sitting there as someone who's been baptized by Paul going, he doesn't remember baptizing me? <laughs> that's like one of my foundations, that's like one of my building blocks for why I follow Paul, not Cephas. I was baptized into Paul. And that brings up a huge point. Human leadership is so huge on something like this. Paul sets this example of saying, I have no concern who identifies themselves with me. It's about Jesus. Human leaders, spiritual leaders, leaders in the church, leaders in the evangelical world, leaders on Wheaton's college camp, uh, Wheaton College's campus, have such an ability to either try to draw people to themselves to join their camp or to simply say, I don't care who's with me. What I want to do is point people to Christ and the cross. <coughs> That's what Paul models for us here. I don't remember who I baptized. And that leads to the final verse, verse 17. He sums it up in this way. He says... For Christ didn't send me to baptize. That is, he didn't send me to baptize people into myself, but to preach the gospel. And not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be empty of its power. Why did Paul come? What was Paul's total focus in Corinth? It was to preach the gospel. It was to point people to Jesus. It was to point people to a crucified and risen Savior. It wasn't to build his army of Paul followers. The cross. And the last phrase, not with eloquent wisdom, lest the cross be emptied of his power, leads into the next section, which we'll cover next week. Well, let me end by saying this. Just two kind of concluding points, and I'll say it positively and then negatively and ask you to apply it to your own hearts and lives. First of all, on the positive side, this passage is teaching us that chasing unity in the gospel, chasing, pursuing unity in the gospel with other believers is a sign of maturity. That's a sign of maturity. 
It's a sign of maturity for you to be actively seeking ways to build unity with people who affirm the gospel and yet are different than you. That's a sign of spiritual maturity. Now, let me just use this as an opportunity to say, I think the best way you can do this during your college years is through involvement in the local church, either this church or others. It's in the church that you are forced to come together with people who are not part of your natural peer group. They're not on your dorm floor or in your terrace apartment or on your football team or in the conservatory or in your COD class, whatever. It forces you to build unity on the basis of the cross, on the basis of the fact that you sit at the foot of the same Savior, that you're washed, justified, sanctified by the same blood. To chase that kind of unity with people who are not like you is a sign of maturity. One of our other pastors, our small group pastor, Stephen Lee, said the other day um, that when he joined a small group once with people he didn't know, they were asking him, hey, how long is it going to take for you to feel like you're kind of um, unified with us? How long is it going to take until you're vulnerable and can open up to us? And he said something that I've repeated a few times because I thought it was brilliant and, and deep. He said, as Christians, because you guys are believers, I already know that I have more in common with you than I have with my own biological brother who has not yet accepted Christ. I choose unity with you on the basis of our common faith. We already have more in common than someone who I've known my whole life because we have Jesus in common. Unity around the gospel is a sign of maturity. And then to put it in the negative, let me just end with this question. Are there any places in your life where you are making unnecessary divisions with those who affirm the same gospel? Unnecessary divisions. So are you dividing the gospel in any way, dividing Christ in any way? Is it on the basis of a certain human leader, a certain camp, just people you don't like? And I'm not saying you need to be best friends with everyone. We're talking about unity, the same mind in Christ. So are there places that you need to, even this week, change as you consider those who are different than you, maybe have different preferences than you, but hold to the same cross, the same Savior, the same true gospel? That's what I think this passage is calling us to today. Let me pray, and we're going to end by singing. Heavenly Father, we don't want to be guilty of dividing Christ. Lord, his prayer before he died and then ascended to heaven was that his followers would be one. Lord God, give us wisdom to know when it is time to divide, when it is time to hold strong to truth. And yet, Lord, for those, with those who hold on to the true gospel of Jesus Christ, help us to chase unity. Lord, help us to not mistake um, fighting, infighting, uh, divisions for maturity, for being passionate about truth. Help us to uphold truth while chasing unity with those who hold to the gospel. And Lord, I pray that in that, our world would see people who are unified under a real, true, risen, and reigning Savior. And we pray all that in his name. Amen. Let's stand and sing our last two songs.
for one way at least that this is going to happen. This is Jesus praying John 17. He says, I don't ask for these only, that is his disciples, but also for all those who will believe in me through their word. That's us. 
that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Our unity with those who affirm Jesus and affirm the gospel is a witness to the world that Jesus is really God and Savior. So let's pursue unity even this week with that in mind. Let me pray. Dear God, we give ourselves to you. Lord, I pray that you would protect us from unnecessary divisions, even if they be in our own hearts and minds in the week to come. Help us to chase, pursue unity with those who affirm the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Show these students what that looks like in the week and the year ahead on Wheaton's campus, COD's campus, this church, in this town. Lord, we commit ourselves to that for our good, for the good of our hearts, for the praise of Jesus, and for the sake of witness to the world around us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.